welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. So I am the first to admit we have some holes in our archive. Well, covering the entirety of human history is not, right. not something that can easily be done. No, yes, <laughs> because the world is enormous and history is basically infinite. We are always going to have holes. But a few of these holes are kind of glaring. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's one particularly big 3,500 square mile hole in the archive, and that is Puerto Rico. So we're going to make that hole just a little smaller today with Hurricane San Siriaco, which was a massive hurricane that struck the island in 1899. I also don't think we've ever done a whole episode just on a hurricane. And since we're right at the start of Atlantic hurricane season, it seems like an appropriate time to do this one. Although there are aspects of this that are uncannily similar to Hurricane Maria, which struck Puerto Rico on September 20th of 2017. So part of me wishes that we had done this way before now. I uh, I like that you use the metaphor of us having a hole that needs to be filled in the archive by then covering a topic that obliterates things and creates Massive gaps. Yeah, that was not <laughs> intentional at all. It was accidental. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, uh, an important and serious topic. Uh, Hurricane San Siriaco struck Puerto Rico at a really precarious point in its history. The United States had just taken possession of the island after centuries of its being controlled by Spain. Christopher Columbus had claimed the island for Spain during his second voyage in 1493, and the island's first Spanish settlement followed in 1508. Then, fast-forwarding to 1898, the United States took possession of Puerto Rico at the end of the Spanish-American War. But this precariousness was not only about the fact that Puerto Rico was suddenly part of a completely different colonial empire, which had a different language, a different culture, and a totally different political system from the one before. The 40 or so years leading up to the Spanish-American War had also been particularly tumultuous. By the middle of the 1800s, Puerto Rico had a population of more than 650,000 people, and the island had developed its own unique culture. This culture drew from a lot of influences, including Spanish colonists, enslaved Africans, and the indigenous Taino, who had lived on the island before the arrival of Spain. And the overwhelming majority of the population was doing agricultural work and living in poverty. The island's sugar and coffee industries were rapidly expanding, which was affecting life all over the island. Sugar and coffee plantations got bigger and bigger, and they crowded out smaller farms that had been growing other crops. Fewer people owned their own land, and people who had been able to subsist on their own crops increasingly became destitute because they no longer had land to grow on. Public health started to suffer, and mortality rates started to rise. This was a major shift. In 1830, less than 30 percent of Puerto Rico's cultivated land was used for export crops. By 1862, that had risen to more than 50 percent. The year of Hurricane San Siriaco, it was approaching 70%. As that percentage of land devoted to export crops increased, Puerto Rico had to import more and more of its food, and it often had a food deficit. So you can imagine it sort of this way. In the decades leading up to the Spanish-American War, both the Spanish government and the island's coffee and sugar planters were approaching Puerto Rico more like a capitalist enterprise meant to grow export crops and less like a place that was home to a population of human beings who needed to survive there. A previous hurricane had put a sharp focus on the problems with this approach. Hurricane San Narciso struck in 1867, at the very end of the hurricane season that year. More than 200 people were killed, and local officials wrote to the Spanish government on the island and to Madrid about the need to invest more money in the island's infrastructure to protect its people and resources before the next major hurricane. That year, only about 3% of government expenditures had gone to public works and infrastructure. And local leaders were clear that this was not enough to ensure a safe and stable island. As more people started to shift to work that was related to growing and processing and shipping export crops, the people in those jobs started trying to organize. Starting in the 1860s, there were recurring cycles of labor strikes and unrest in rural areas. And as is usually the case, when industries start trying to organize, this whole process was difficult and sometimes violent. Efforts to organize were also hampered by prejudice against rural workers. 
Both Spain and Puerto Rican elite saw the island's rural labor as lazy and shiftless, so they weren't inclined to negotiate with the labor organizations that were trying to form. And all these changes were really just the beginning. Also, starting in the late 1860s, were a series of civil rights and independence movements. Some of them were being influenced by similar movements in Cuba. Spanish authorities put down a rebellion in Puerto Rico in September of 1868, but gradually started allowing the island more freedoms starting the next year. In 1873, Puerto Rico very briefly became a republic, and it also abolished slavery. But that republic was overthrown in a military coup just a year later. On November 25, 1897, Spain granted Puerto Rico the right to self-government. This was in response to a number of pressures, including the Cuban War of Independence, which had started in 1895. So obviously that is a lot of major change in just a few decades. And this right to self-government had its own layer of controversy. Some advocates were satisfied with this level of autonomy, but others wanted true independence. Regardless, though, this right to self-government did not last long at all. The Spanish-American War started just six months after it was granted, and then the United States invaded Puerto Rico on July 25th, 1898. The invasion of Puerto Rico was part of a much bigger conflict that also included Cuba in the Caribbean and Guam and the Philippines in the Pacific. And initially, the United States had planned to invade Puerto Rico earlier in the war and then use it as a stepping stone to get to the more strategically important target of Cuba. But in the end, the United States largely skipped that step, invading Puerto Rico after Spanish forces in Cuba had actually already surrendered. The U.S. assumed control of Puerto Rico on October 18, 1898. When the United States invaded Puerto Rico, Spain's ultimate surrender in the war seemed like a foregone conclusion. In other words, the United States didn't need to invade Puerto Rico in order to win the war. But doing so meant that once the United States and Spain sat down to negotiate terms for the end of the war, the United States would already have a Puerto Rican presence. And then that would give the United States a better claim to the island. The Treaty of Paris of 1898 formally ended the Spanish-American War, and the United States gained control of Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam. The treaty was signed on December 10, 1898. So, after more than 400 years of being Spanish territory, the last 30 years of which had seen ongoing efforts for self-governance and independence, in the blink of an eye, Puerto Rico instead belonged to the United States and was placed under the control of the U.S. military. This meant that Puerto Rico was once again seeing lots of rapid change, and those changes were playing out right before one of the most catastrophic hurricanes ever to strike the island, and we are going to talk about that after a sponsor break. When the United States officially took possession of Puerto Rico, it established a military government that immediately got to work trying to make major changes on the island. The United States and Spain each had their own system for dealing with colonial territory, and the United States was basically trying to shape Puerto Rico to be more American. That meant a lot of change and a lot of chaos. The United States took control of Puerto Rico in October of 1898, and on April 2 of 1900, President McKinley signed the Foraker Act, which established a civilian government. Between October 1898 and May 1, 1900, when the island's first civil governor was inaugurated, there were four different military governors. These governors implemented all kinds of new policies, some of which were effective and some of which were not. Coffee and sugar plantations were really struggling because of the war and because of other economic issues, so they implemented a moratorium on foreclosures. This was to try to protect that part of the economy. But this had an unintended side effect of causing a credit freeze within the agriculture sector, which led to its own economic problems. Military governors also declared an eight-hour workday, banned cockfighting, and implemented a compulsory public education system, as well as a new judicial system. They established a weather bureau and began a whole collection of surveys, audits, and inventories to figure out what exactly the United States had come into possession of. And a lot of this work continued to go on in the immediate aftermath of the hurricane. Yeah, as I was reading reports of uh, the, the military governor in the, in the hurricane's immediate aftermath, there would be some that would be pages of documents of how the new legal system was going to work. 
And I was like, people are starving right now. Right. <laughs> this is maybe not the time to be outlining. I mean, that that's important too, but maybe the food distribution should be a bigger priority. It's almost such a disconnect that you have to surmise that someone was like in shock and just going, I don't know, can I make sense of something, even if it's not going to help in any way? Yeah. So all of this had been going on for less than a year when Hurricane San Siriaco struck. So Hurricane San Siriaco was a Cape Verde hurricane. This is a term used to describe hurricanes that develop off the coast of Africa near the Cape Verde Islands. They strengthen into hurricanes before they ever get to the Caribbean. They're a lot more common later on in the Atlantic hurricane season, and these storms move over a lot of warm ocean before they ever pass over any land, so they tend to be very large, powerful, and long-lived storms. Hurricane San Siriaco began as a tropical storm southwest of the Cape Verde Islands on August 2, 1899. By August 5th, it had strengthened into a Category 1 hurricane. On the 7th, it passed over Guadalupe, southeast of Puerto Rico. Weather officials there reported wind speeds of 120 miles per hour. It's about 192 kilometers per hour, and that made it a Category 3 hurricane. The hurricane struck Puerto Rico on August 8th, the feast day of Roman Catholic St. Syriacus. The United States wasn't actually naming hurricanes at this point, but in Puerto Rico, they were named for the saint's feast day that they made landfall on. Hurricane San Siriaco moved from the southwest corner of the island to the northeast, with the eye roughly moving over the center of the island. The entire island was affected. Most sources describe Hurricane San Siriaco as a Category 4 hurricane when it struck Puerto Rico. Some parts of the island reported 23 inches of rainfall in 24 hours. Rivers flooded, passing their previous high water marks. It took roughly six hours for the eye to pass over the whole island, and the rain persisted long after the hurricane was gone. The island recorded 28 consecutive days of rainfall. This was the height of hurricane season, and Puerto Rico was used to experiencing hurricanes and tropical storms. But the island had gone more than 10 years without seeing a major hurricane. The most recent one had been Hurricane San Felipe in 1876, and that was nothing in comparison to San Siriaco. This was the worst catastrophe in Puerto Rican history up until this point. The island's electrical grid was destroyed, along with the telephone and telegraph system. Some of the wooden structures and other buildings in more urban areas survived the storm, but in more rural areas, most homes were built from mud with thatched roofs. These structures were completely washed away. The trees that would have provided the thatch were also uprooted, which meant that there wasn't any roofing material available to rebuild. Most of the island's cultivated crops were destroyed, including about half of the sugar crop and almost all of the coffee crop. This was just before the coffee harvest, and not only were the coffee plants themselves destroyed, but the shade trees that sheltered them were uprooted as well. It takes about five years for new coffee plants to produce fruit, so this was a catastrophic blow to the coffee industry, and most of the food crops were destroyed as well. San Juan, the island's capital and largest city, is on the more northeastern coast of the island, and the hurricane's eye passed well to the southwest of it, somewhat sparing the city. But the second biggest city of Ponce is on the more southwestern coast of the island, and it was hit really hard. More than 500 people drown in the city of Ponce alone. But the municipality that faced the greatest losses was Utuado in the mountainous center of the island, which was the seat of the coffee industry. About 3,400 people died in flooding or building collapses on the day of the hurricane. This was more than three times the recorded deaths of any prior hurricane in Puerto Rico. Even so, that number is probably a lot lower than the actual death toll, since disease and hunger-related illnesses spread in the wake of a storm like this. By the time the hurricane passed, more than 250,000 people were left homeless and destitute. That was more than a quarter of the island's population. A lot of people saw this as a divine retribution, but against whom really depended on your point of view. Here's how this was described in the September 1899 issue of the Bulletin Mercantile de Puerto Rico. Quote, The eighth day of August will be a day of terrible memory for Puerto Rico. 
before the island had recovered from the state of perturbation and turmoil in which the Spanish-American War left it, and when all its efforts to reconquer its previous normality and prosperity were successively and fatally failing, an extremely violent hurricane hammered the island, intensifying the measure of its pains, immersing it in the most horrendous ruin, and destroying the last hope for its salvation and welfare. There only remains of this Antillean isle, once so celebrated for its beauty and fecundity, heaps of rubble spread everywhere, which represent a history full of tears, death, and misfortune for its inhabitants. After passing over Puerto Rico, Hurricane San Siriaco continued through the Caribbean, passing over other islands and reaching the Bahamas as a Category 3 hurricane on August 12th. From there, the storm roughly followed the North American coastline from Florida to the North Carolinas. The eye stayed well offshore until the storm shifted north and then northwest, striking the North Carolina Outer Banks as a Category 3 hurricane on August 17th. If you look at a map of this, it really looks like it was just safely headed out to sea and then went, oh, you know what? The Outer Banks look like a good target. And the Outer Banks saw extensive flooding, especially on Hatteras and Ocracoke Islands. Most of the structures were destroyed on the island of Shackelford Banks. Its whole population relocated, and today the island is undeveloped and home to wild horses. Water contamination, drowned farm animals, and unearthed cemeteries were all a major problem in the Outer Banks, along with the destruction of fishing equipment in multiple fishing communities. At least seven ships were lost to Hurricane San Siriaco, including the 643-ton cargo ship Priscilla, which wrecked off the North Carolina coast on the night of the 16th. From the Outer Banks, the storm returned to sea, following the North American coastline until August 24th, when it turned east and eventually dissipated off the coast of Ireland on September 4th. Its remains hit France on September 9th, It is still the longest-lived storm ever tracked in the Atlantic. Obviously, this was a destructive and deadly storm. Everywhere that it hit that was populated, the aftermath was particularly devastating in Puerto Rico, and we will get to that after a sponsor break. As is often the case in natural disasters, people describe the immediate aftermath of Hurricane San Siriaco as something of a honeymoon period. The wealthiest people who lived mostly in the cities tried to help out with donations of food and offers of shelter wherever they could. There was a general sense of people pulling together. The military governor at this point was Major General George Whitefield Davis. His administration established an advisory board, which included Puerto Rican civilians, to make recommendations on hurricane relief. Davis also ordered for food crops to be planted immediately to try to replenish the island's food supply. Although the military government made a lot of the decisions on what was to be done, those decisions were often carried out by municipal councils known as ayuntamientos. And since there was a lot of variation in how efficient and capable all these various municipal councils were, there was also a lot of variation in how things actually went at the local level. The military government also created 12 inspection zones, following the same lines that had already been used to divide the island into administrative districts. Eventually, some of these zones were subdivided for logistical reasons, making the total 17. Military officers were sent into all of these zones to assess the damage and make appeals for food and other relief. Davis and many of his officers also put some of their salaries toward the relief effort. But this initial period of cooperation wasn't nearly enough to offset the scope of the damage. Municipal governments and other local officials in these districts were quickly overwhelmed, and often they just didn't have any food or other contribution to offer. Since Puerto Rico's food was mostly imported, and since it had already been prone to food deficits, there wasn't much of a stored surplus to provide to people who now had nothing. Food distribution was also really difficult because of the colossal damage to the already shaky infrastructure. However, the military government in Puerto Rico and the greater U.S. government both had a vested interest in seeming benevolent and organized to the people of its new Puerto Rican territory. So Davis asked for the federal government to call on its citizens to provide aid. Puerto Ricans were not U.S. citizens at this point. That would not happen until 1917. Secretary of War Elihu Root was quoted in the New York Times on August 12th, quote, 
Under these conditions, the president deems that an appeal should be made to the humanity of the American people. It is an appeal to their patriotism also, for the inhabitants of Puerto Rico have freely and gladly submitted themselves to the guardianship of the United States and have voluntarily surrendered the protection of Spain, to which they were formerly entitled confidently relying upon the more generous and beneficent treatment at our hands. The highest considerations of honor and good faith unite with the promptings of humanity to require from the United States a generous response to the demand of Puerto Rican distress. There were other appeals for aid as well, with numerous elected officials asking for their constituents to contribute. One of these came from Theodore Roosevelt, who was then the governor of New York. The State Merchants Association in New York also became the central collection point for donations, which were then shipped to Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, a charity board was established with a central office in San Juan. It was under the control of Major John Van Hoff, and there were clergy and medical personnel on the board. The charity board asked for each of Puerto Rico's municipalities to establish its own committee, led by three, quote, people of respectability. For the first few days after the hurricane, the military government distributed ration cards, which authorized the bearer to collect a weekly allotment of beans, rice, and dried codfish or bacon for their household. But on August 19th, the Department of Puerto Rico issued General Order 124, which began, quote, It having been brought to the attention of the department commander that idle, able-bodied men are refusing to work at fair wages... It is hereby ordered that no such man who so refuses will be permitted to draw food for himself or his family. So as we mentioned earlier in the show, the rural population of Puerto Rico, particularly its most impoverished residents, faced a lot of discrimination and prejudice. This had been true under Spanish rule. It was still true under the American military government. And it was also true among the Puerto Rican upper class. Basically, everyone of means thought everyone else in Puerto Rico was lazy, ignorant, and dishonest, and didn't care about their own poverty or social conditions. There was a lot of concern that giving people free food would make them lazier and totally dependent on handouts. So it's very likely that a lot of the people who were described in this statement as refusing to work for fair wages could not find work or had some reason why they could not work. So a new system evolved in which aid went to the planters rather than directly to Puerto Rico's poor. Planters put in a requisition for laborers to work on their coffee and sugar plantations. And then the laborers who were hired for those positions had to present a work card documenting their labor in order to receive food. This, unsurprisingly, led to a lot of problems. Although 32 million pounds of food were distributed to 117,000 people over the span of 10 months, the only people who were able to get it were the ones who were able to find work, and this wasn't necessarily easy to do given the massive destruction of the coffee and uh, sugar industries. It also led to people accepting lower wages than they had gotten before the hurricane struck just so they could do the work that was required to get the food. Compounding all of this was an assumption among the wealthier people that the rural population was exaggerating how dire the situation was. The prevailing reasoning was that the rural people were used to being poor, so they should be able to manage without so much help. There were apparently several people that proposed various bond referenda to fund rebuilding of public works, employing people to do so. And I kept finding, like, the proposals, and I was like, did you ever do that, though? (laughs) Because there's a lot to the rebuilding effort besides just distributing food to people. Anyway, the whole thing was a complicated mess and led to a lot of people not being able to get the aid that they needed. And then another aspect of the relief program was a tax moratorium. Because of the war and a previous economic crisis, a lot of people had not paid their taxes for the prior year, and wealthy planters, local officials, and other prominent people started to petition for a moratorium on taxes for both the prior and current tax years. There was a lot of back and forth over all of this. The vast majority of petitions that came in for tax relief were from wealthy planters. But the hurricane had impacted people all over the economic spectrum, not just the wealthy. Some officials recommended a program in which only people who could prove that they had suffered a loss could get tax relief. But others pointed out that figuring out which claims were legitimate and which weren't would be a colossal and expensive effort considering the scope of the damage. 
In the end, the military government suspended taxes on August 22nd, 1899, but this was temporary. And by 1902, the government was still owed almost 300 million pesos in unpaid taxes. Most of those taxes that were still owed were owed by large planters whose crops had been destroyed by the hurricane. This tax relief certainly may have helped both workers and planters in the immediate aftermath of the hurricane. But it also meant that there was no money to fund projects and services that had previously relied on taxation. So while the relief effort focused on food distribution, there was far less tax revenue to fund other parts of the rebuilding effort. Although Congress did not pass a relief bill, it did return $2 million in tax revenues on products that had come into the continental United States from Puerto Rico since the occupation. This was a tiny amount of money compared to the scope of the damage. The total damages were valued at an estimated $20 million. And also, planters wanted this returned tax money to go into agricultural investment instead of into rebuilding efforts. All of this had an ongoing and long-lasting effect on the island of Puerto Rico. In 1899, its coffee exports were only 10% of what they had been on average in the five years before the Spanish-American War and the coffee industry never really recovered. In addition to that five-year growing time before new plants would bear fruit, the Puerto Rican coffee industry couldn't really compete with Brazil or Central America, which were producing cheaper coffee at a much lower labor cost. This was economically devastating for the island's mountainous interior, which was conducive to growing coffee, but not to many other crops. The sugar industry recovered more quickly. Its 1899 crop was only about a third of normal size. The hurricane also destroyed a number of the industry's older haciendas, which had to be replaced with more modern sugar processing facilities. The hurricane and flooding also kind of ironically wound up enriching the soil in sugar-growing areas. So as the coffee industry in Puerto Rico declined, the sugar industry grew. However, at the same time, at least 5,000 people left the island after the hurricane to work as laborers elsewhere, including in Hawaii's sugar industry. This shift from coffee to sugar accelerated in 1900, after the passage of the Foraker Act. The act described Puerto Rico, which it spelled P-O-R-T-O, as an, quote, unorganized territory of the United States, with its citizens being citizens of Puerto Rico, again spelled incorrectly. The Foraker Act also specified that Puerto Rico was subject to 15% tariff on goods going to the United States and vice versa. Then in 1901, Puerto Rico became a customs area of the United States in terms of international trade. So Puerto Rico could ship sugar and tobacco into the United States without a tariff, But coffee wasn't produced on the continent, so it wasn't protected from the tariff. Before the Spanish-American War, the coffee industry had also been sending most of its products to Cuba and Spain, and now that Puerto Rico wasn't Spanish territory, it was subject to high tariffs on those exports as well. All of this had a major economic impact on the island. Before the hurricane, coffee had been Puerto Rico's biggest export. But by 1910, coffee was only 10% of Puerto Rico's exports, and sugar was 64%. The amount of land devoted to farming sugar also roughly doubled during that time, while the land used for coffee was roughly halved. The collapse of the coffee industry caused a major economic crisis in the island's interior. All of these changes, plus using the planters to distribute relief to the workers, made the planters much more powerful on the island of Puerto Rico. And the island became even more dependent on imports for necessities like food, while putting more and more of its labor toward manufacturing exports. All of this set the stage for the way that Puerto Rico developed as a territory after this point. The hurricane and the relief effort also played a part in the Foraker Act, which Congress began working on in January of 1900. This was just five months after the hurricane, only halfway through the 10 months of food distribution. Much of the island was still destroyed when that act was drafted. All of this contributed to the decision to make Puerto Rico an unincorporated territory, rather than making Puerto Rico an independent nation. Puerto Rico's relationship to the United States has continued to evolve in the decades since then, but at this point, it's the only former Spanish possession in the Americas that has not become independent. Also, the week that we are recording this episode uh, is the same week that that study was released uh, that the death toll in Hurricane Maria was actually thousands of people more 
than originally reported. And one of the things that keeps coming up in reporting of that study is the same prejudices that we were talking about affecting the way that aid was distributed here, affecting the way that aid was distributed in Hurricane Maria, and the way that people were talked about in Puerto Rico during Hurricane Maria. So somehow we have not learned anything in 120 years. No. Do you have listener mail? It's less of a bummer, maybe? Uh, Yeah, I do. It's from Liz. Liz says, hi, Tracy and Holly. I've been listening for a few years, and I am happy to finally have a reason to write to you. I was a few episodes behind, but then I saw you posted an episode about Prague just before my trip there. I knew I had to skip ahead. I listened on my drive to the airport. I visited the site of one of the defenestrations in the old town hall, and surprisingly, they provided basically no information about why it happened. I would have had no idea but for your podcast, so thanks for providing an excellent introduction to some Czech history at the perfect time. I've attached some photos of the room where it happened as well as the official information guide. I also visited Prague Castle, where the other defenestration occurred. They did have signs marking the 400th anniversary and explaining the historical context. They also vigorously disputed the menorah myth, which unfortunately other historical sites here repeated as fact. I have established photos from the castle as well. The defenestrations occurred from the far left window in the middle row. And then uh, there are obelisks that mark where the victims landed. Thanks again for everything you do. You keep my commute interesting and educational, Liz. And Liz sent several pictures, as this email suggests. Thank you so much, Liz. I heard from a a couple of people that were like, historians now recognize that the manure thing didn't happen at all. And, like, I wasn't able to find any historians... (laughs) (laughs) I <laughs> really said that. Um, multiple sources that were used in that episode say that the people that were thrown out the window definitely landed in manure. So apparently there is some debate about whether the manure thing. Well, maybe really there happened. was manure, but it didn't really help. <laughs> <laughs> it did not provide the soft landing. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it would be a gross landing. There's no way around that. I yeah. Think. Yeah. So uh, it's we do know that they were thrown out the window and that they were not seriously harmed. The manure thing, apparently, some debate. So if you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And then we're at Missing History all over social media. That is our name on, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. If you come to our website, which is MissingHistory.com, you will find show notes for all the episodes that Holly and I have ever worked on. Uh, You will also find a searchable archive of all the episodes we have ever done. So you can do all of that and a whole lot more if you come to MissedInHistory.com. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever else you find podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 